Welcome back to the Old Colony Cast, a podcast about all things Plymouth and surrounding areas. And I am joined once again by our host, uh, Fish. Hello. And Hannah is back as well. Hello. And so, Hannah, just prior to the show, we were talking, uh, you wanted to update us on the uh, Wampanoag situation. Yeah, so uh, we, as previously mentioned, I think it was like a, a few episodes ago, um, the Trump administration was actually trying to seize their lands in the Mashpee or Cape Cod area, um, and a judge just ruled in their favor. So they are able to keep their, their land at this moment, just basic, it, what was- basic privileges. <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm trying to remember i can't remember why they were trying to seize it but we felt it was kind of like a to prevent the casino type the of building thing. exactly yeah, yeah he there's uh some friends of the federal government that have casinos in rhode island they didn't want one built too closely to the other casinos but i don't do we remember what they're rationale for it just it just wasn't so you couldn't build a casino here no no they they were just like and we're gonna take this back now i think so (laughs) and i I did see another article recently something about they're trying to seize uh some underwater area off of cape yeah that just happened it's a uh like a seashore monument so Mm -hmm. um i shared the article earlier so that's still, it's just being opened up for fishing, commercial fishing, which right now it is not, um, specifically to protect numbers and sustainability with the oceans. So um, the New England Aquarium has spoken out against it since they heard. So I believe there will be some sort of, hopefully some availability for judgment on that at some point. So we'll see. All right. Well, fingers crossed. And if our listeners want to, I'm sure they can reach out to their state representatives or senators and uh, speak out against that. That would be helpful and important to do. Exactly. I was going to say, Hannah, you can't just not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the other thing, uh, you know, the giant elephant in the room is the current protesting in I can't even say in every major city. It's in like multiple countries now. It's it's all over the world. Um, yeah, and we've e- even experienced it here, right here in Plymouth. Uh, Hannah, you attended the protest that started down at Brewster Garden. Yes, I did, um, and I think obviously the the idea behind these protests is to get attention on things happening in our country and towns and wherever that are uh, un- like unlawful and just not right to people. And uh, I mean, black people in our country and other people of color. So definitely not a cool time, but in a way it is um, shedding a lot of light on things that need to change. So, and there was a lot of tension. I know I've <laughs> spoken to a lot of business owners in town where, there was concern over damage to their property and you know, in the major city ones, there's a lot of looting and vandalism. Uh, I, I, you know, maybe I'm just a overly positive person, but I'm like, I don't think we're going to see that here in Plymouth, which uh, I don't believe we saw any. And was there any issues at all there that you noticed? No, not, not really. Um, for the most part, it was like pretty calm and everyone was there to do what they they felt like needed to happen and it was, it went, it went as well as it could have, I believe. So, um, it was definitely good to be a part of. Yeah. Felt right. Um, unfortunately I wasn't able to make it. I was literally in the middle of recording a podcast when that was going down. Um, but it was, I mean, pretty much in my backyard and I was able to kind of pop online later and see a lot of the videos. It was, it was really honestly really moving. And, um, but in a very Plymouthy kind of way at the end, someone showed up with a karaoke stage on wheels. 
Oh, he's been driving around the whole South Shore for this entire stay at home order. <laughs> <He's>, uh, <laughs> okay. That's separate. Um, <laughs> but it just seems that, like that ended it, you know? It did. That was quite the finale. Um, he does karaoke at different places around town. I think he's just like promoting things well. Uh, while there's not a lot going on and mm-hmm. he doesn't have his karaoke nights. So I think that just so happened to happen. Oh, so it's just a coincidence kind of thing. And uh, Yeah, I was at like the Taco Bell in Hanover the other day and he drove by. Like he's all over the place. Yeah. He's like, where can the... Looking for the people and just out there to promote. So he hit, he hit Plymouth on a good night, I guess. Yeah, that's a motivated guy right there. Um, yeah. He actually is a really great karaoke host. I think his name is Brendan. That's it, about. It I, looked. It looked pretty elaborate. I mean, there were lights and yeah. the screens on this trailer on the car. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, he does kar- karaoke at uh, pins on like Wednesday nights or something. Oh, sure. Uh, so <laughs> that was kind of a segue into today's topic. Uh, racism has always been an issue. Um, you know, I'd like to say hopefully these protests will end it, but I, it's doubtful. Hopefully it'll make the situation better. But um, so today we're going to be talking about Dighton Rock, which has quite a bit of history built into it as far as racism and thinking people of color are inferior. Is that probably the best way of putting it? Yeah. And I mean, I almost wanted to cap off like the conversation around it with that in mind but starting it i think is just as just as well mm-hmm. so there's so many theories ar- around why D- dighton rock exists in the for those who don't know like the ca- there's carvings and symbols and emblems and things in the rock that have uh kind of just pulled at people's imaginations over the years as to who actually carved them into the stone um when really the the, there's a very glaring answer to it and it's likely the people who were already living in the area. Um, but besides that, it has made for a lot of interesting theories around what or who or whatever carved into the rock. Um, so we can kind of start from the beginning, I guess, or at least the... Sounds the, like a good place to start. Right? <laughs> or, or at least uh, the beginning of col- colonizing history. So it, in 1680, the rock was brought to attention by Reverend John Danforth, um, who had recently graduated from Harvard. So, which I still think is one of those little moments in time that it is cool to compare. So Harvard had been up and running in 1680, and this guy was like a new oh, graduate man. from you know, like, yeah. wow, that's an old school. So, and this guy was pretty old school himself. No, um, <laughs> I don't know, don't know much about him. But he I was, was trying a, to think of like, did they park the, the the horse and cart in Harvard Yard? <laughs> I was trying to like. He parked the. Uh, yeah, I can't get there. The horse either, and so. cat. Yeah, the cat. Yeah, the cat. And have and yad by the rack. <laughs> rock. Or you can't do that one. Yeah. So, yeah, 1680, that's when he uh, notices the the rocks sticking out of the Taunton River. Um, he sees very clearly that there are carvings. They're very noticeable from, I mean, a good distance away. So moving up the river, the rock is facing Mount mount hope bay which is the bay between massachusetts and rhode island or i believe it might just be rhode island in that part but the taunton river moves up north it's like through new bedford fall river and then eventually up into dighton which was where the rock was originally found or at least that area was called after the fact and um they couldn't see the entire rock at that moment because of the tide of the river it's a saltwater river so it does move with the, the water of the ocean or at least partly salt um but what they could see were what probably looked like or looks like carvings of people, symbols. Some people think the symbols might be letters, um, animals or animal prints, possibly a boat. It's all very interpretive, which I think kind of led to all of the suggestions of who might have done it. 
Um, so after it was dis- not discovered, but recognized in 1680, the first person to kind of express the first of almost 35 theories that are out there, but there's several really popular ones was Ezra Stiles in 1783. And he's a theologian and an educator and suggested that the carvings were made from early Phoenician discoverers. He doesn't exactly say when, but he thinks like the Romans peddled their way down to Massachusetts. (laughs) Sure, it's right around the corner. Why not? Because if there's anything Romans loved, it's the open ocean. Yeah. (laughs) Loved it. Couldn't get enough. Got freaked out by the English Channel, but still. Yeah. Now, Now, is it because he thought the carvings resembled Roman? Yeah, writing? I th- that- it, did, it didn't really de- dive into like a not many of these people's explanations as to why. Um, I think they really were going based off of this. Is he was an an expert in some way of Phoenician like ongoings and history? So he was kind of just comparing and contrasting the two. Okay. Um. Yeah. And then after that was our Reverend Cotton Mather, who didn't really talk about who he thought made the rock, but he did bring it some notoriety when he mentioned it in one of his books, The Wonderful Works of God, uh, commemorated, or The Wonderful Works of God Commemorated is the name of the book. Um, And he gives a nice long quote about it being, just a be- like a great water rock in the middle. He talks about rocks like I do. Like he just really likes them. <laughs> so just for like, some, some reference, do we have a, a so we don't have people travel to Dighton Rock and be disappointed? It, it, isn't it only like five feet tall? It's five feet tall. It's nine feet long and uh, or nine feet wide and eleven feet long. The, so the basic dimensions it's, of it. It's, it's a big rock. It's a 40 ton sandstone boulder. So oh, yeah. it's big. It's, uh, they decided to describe it as gray brown in case you were wondering the color. Uh, <laughs> probably the same color as any rock in the area. So it didn't really stand out too, too much from the other rocks there because there are a lot of just boulders or large rocks left behind from glacier movement but this one obviously stood out because of the carbons carbons, on it yes yes which they really do take up that one whole entire side of the rock so like a a nine feet wide so like a nine by five yes so it's basically a 45 square foot petroglyph yeah sure mural works right yeah i mean there's it's not necessarily coherence it's not like by any argument one cohesive piece but it's you know a nine by five jam piece i guess yeah a jam piece i like that what is it a collage kind of yeah it's it's just a you know it's when you have your sketchbook out and you draw something here and you draw a little piece there and you cover the whole page but it's not meant to be one drawing. Which is, I think, a lot of where the confusion came from because some people are looking at it as one drawing. And I mean, we technically, we still don't know. It might, you know, but uh, Reverend Cotton Mather mentions it, which brings some popularity to it. And I actually think he definitely would have discussed that before Ezra Stiles. Um, theory about the Phoenicians because he's a bit older. I don't know if you guys recognize Cotton Mather's name. Yeah, he's Salem Witch Trials. That's right. And oh, I'm nice. cheating because I think Hannah and I both read the same book. <laughs> um, so, no, that's okay. I, I feel like I actually needed, I need a little, wherever you feel like I needs more information, just pop it in there because okay. I'm all for it. I feel like there were just so many vague ideas about the rock. (laughs) I was like, I mean, there there are a whole ton of vague ones in about, I'd say five or six, like 
I'm going to say mainstream, but they're like the major beliefs. They're the major arguments. Exactly. So we're going kind of through the more major ones. But uh, the next one would be from James Russell Lowell, the writer, poet, editor, satirist in the 19th century, um, who actually, he didn't actually suggest any to my knowledge, I didn't see it, that he was suggesting who wrote what or who it came from, more or less uh, using it as a way to, for presidential candidates to incite some idea about what The Rock meant. It was a little confusing. Essentially, he was trying to incite the communities or people to decipher The Rock and its meaning and send them in, send in their what they think The Rock means. Um, which like I'm that, sure just- it seems like that was like a, a recurring thing like they wanted to use Plymouth Rock to to signify what was going on in the Revolutionary War like must have been a you know they didn't have TV so they wanted rocks to you know carry meaning yeah and especially with Dighton Rock it's and the one thing we're going to notice going on is no two drawings of the rock look the same. No, anytime someone sits down and tries to draw what they see, like the markings on the rock, it's different, like completely different to the point. So you're not really sure what they're, there's just so much there that no one's going to get all of it. So it's always just a slightly different sketch. So you're going to interpret it slightly differently and see what you want to see. Um, which is very true. It leads me to the next, probably one of the bigger suggestions of what it means. Delbar, Edmund Delbar. He actually noted oh, that we're skipping it, the Norse. No, we're not. We're getting there. So I but thought De- the Norse were before the, was before Delbar. No, but I just want to talk about Delbar because he described it as a Rorschach test. Okay, fair. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that just kind of like, I was like, next point, that's kind of in line with what you just said. So, okay. yeah, he described it as like two fishes point exactly. Like anyone could look at it and see what they want to see from it, j- similarly to a Rorschach test. So, so far like, in all of history, he's probably the most right. Um. <laughs> I mean, let's come back to let's come back to that. Okay. Yeah, maybe not. Cause, so, <laughs> let, cause let's what? let's loop back around to Delbar because I'd argue that his argument is one of the later ones, and it's also it, it's a little bit after, kind of the most current. Semi, yeah. So, in a lot of ways, next one would be the Norse explanation. Um, in 1837, Carl Christian. Raffin, who was a Danish historian and translator and antiquarian, so he proposed that it was most likely Norse explorers or or Vikings, as most people know them, um, that had explored the area before European colonists had, like, like, well before. Like, we're talking, like, year 1003. So he's putting it way ahead of everyone else. Than banking okay. on on the Vikings, I guess, um, and again, kind of based off of what they're seeing, like this guy was likely one of the people who's seeing a group of people on a boat because of certain like pieces or carvings in the stone that might suggest that some people are on a boat. Um, again, just one of the theories. That's probably one of the more popular ones that's talked about. I think like. As soon as you search it online, I think the theory about it being Vikings was the yeah. first thing that popped up. Is that one well, of the reasons why people think that Vikings were here prior to Christopher Columbus? Or It's one of the many. Okay. You've got that. You've got uh, the Vinland Saga, which was a uh, Icelandic, basically, mythology slash storytelling that described... Uh, Leif Erikson moving, basically exploring what ended up being uh, Northeast North America. There is an actual encampment at uh, Lanzo Meadow up in, 
I'm going to say Nova Scotia or Newfoundland. I should I should be looking this up. So, well, no, I, my my thing is there's other evidence that they were here. Well, there, not just there is other Lindsay evidence. Rock thing. There is other evidence for varying vague degrees of evidence. Okay, like there is actual archaeological evidence that they were in Canada. There is a lot of wishful thinking and optimism and racism saying that they got anywhere else. Okay. Fair like they, they got there. You just can't prove they were anywhere else. And as a rule, the people who say the Norse were here first are generally people who are related to the Norse. Yeah. This guy definitely is related to the Norse. I mean, he's Danish. <laughs> <laughs> he's a Dane. Yeah. He's definitely, <laughs> It's definitely got some Viking blood, but it, there's it's the kind of thing where you look down and again with a rock you see what you want to see. So he wanted he goes in there, he sees Vikings because he's a Viking. Got it. Um, where was I? So we talked about him. Like, definitely the most prominent of the suggested theories of that rock. Um, A little bit after him, in the early 1900s, was Edmund Delbar. Uh, He was a researcher at Brown Brown University. Um, And he actually thought that... His was the most interesting theory to me. He thought it was abbreviated Latin. And he was claiming that it was proof that the explorer or, uh, yeah, explorer Miguel Cortiriel um, from 1502 was actually present in that part of America. They, they do know that he made it to Canada, but again, there was like no proof that he really made it south of Canada and to, at least into Massachusetts, like southern New England. Um, so putting the Portuguese in the area, probably like one of the first explorations of the, the New England area. Um, but he says that it is translated from abbreviated Latin to I Miguel Contariel, 1511 in this place by the will of God, I became chief of the Indians. Um, and it should be noted that he kidnapped 50 first nation people from Canada. So, <laughs> So, I don't know. I know a lot of people were doing that around then. Maybe not a trusted source, but this guy, it, I feel like, it, I don't know how you could see that. also be noted but. that Miguel Corteriel uh, disappeared in 1502. So, there we go. Yeah, he was a, he was an explorer. And in 1502, he was up off the coast of Canada. And then he never came back, so no one, kno- so no. no one knows what happened to him. So, so the argument seems to be that over the course of nine years, he went from wherever he, his ship sank in Canada to Taunton. If it wasn't Which Taunton, I really, then I know, I, but I like calling it Taunton. To, the, <laughs> to, to Taunton. <laughs> well, it's just that. So over the course, so he made it to Taunton, and then despite the fact that he didn't speak the language or didn't know anyone, took over as king of the tribes because, of course, he did because he was a white man. Right. Because that's just what you do. I think that is the most um, specific translation to come out of it. Like, that's pretty... Again, I don't know Latin, and I, don't, I honestly don't even see letters I necessarily. Yeah, I was looking at I didn't see I saw X's. Lots of X's. Lots of tons of them. A lot of X's, a couple of deer, maybe? I saw a couple of deer. Right. But it's the kind of thing where you can definitely see what you want to see in it. And this was that same I, guy I, that said it was a Rorschach test, right? Yeah. Exactly. And Think, and I feel kind of I do, I do feel kind of bad I do, for the guy. I do like the it's a Rorschach test and this is what it says. But here's the <laughs> thing. As he was working on it, like his paper, the Portuguese thing kind of comes across as kind of pulled out of his 
out of nowhere. Like, through most of the paper, he seems to be building to a conclusion that it's native. But then as he gets to the end, he realizes that if he does that, no one will care. So he comes up with a more interesting solution. It's definitely interesting. Oh, it's interesting. I mean, it's a load of bunk. Because... No. (laughs) I'm sorry, but... It doesn't, te- it doesn't pass the smell test of this guy who had disappeared nine years earlier showed up and took over the local tribes. Yeah, no. I mean, it definitely doesn't, uh, no. doesn't speak to any other truths that we know about the area. Yeah, so. like anything. Like I'd there are say- no Portuguese. Sorry. Well, now there are. <laughs> there are no Portuguese, honestly, and that's kind of the thing. That's... Like, if you go to the Dighton Rock Museum, I'm going to say now, but at least recently, because I haven't been, I haven't checked in the last few years, they had a, you would go in and part of the tour was you would have, like, separate interpretations of the rock. Like, you'd go in and this is the Phoenician interpretation, and this is the... Norse, and this is the Hebrew, and because anytime they can toss the lost tribes of Israel somewhere, they will. And this is the Portuguese one, and the Portuguese one is kind of the one they lean into, mainly because um, it's southeast Massachusetts. Yeah, there's a lot of first there are a lot of Portuguese second, people around here. Yeah, Azorian. A lot and... of lot of Portuguese people. Yes. Yes. Um, is a popular area. Yeah. Um, I so I went there probably a couple weekends ago. Okay. For, forgetting the time that we're living in currently. And I'm and assuming that, they were closed. They very closed. <laughs> very closed. So just I was able, you know, lovely park area that we were able to walk around in, but. Um, we weren't actually able to go see the rock, which was a bummer. So, saw the building. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> um, one of the more recent uh, suggestions of who were the sculptors or inscriptors of that rock is from Gavin Menzies, who suggested it It was from 1421 from early Chinese explorers, which like was totally out of left field. I haven't heard anything about that. And that's like the furthest people, the people who travel the furthest to get there. Yeah. And I mean, he's a British author and he's really, uh, I looked at it. He's like got a whole book about how China explored way more than like pretty much than we ever thought they did. So he seems like he knows what he's talking about to an extent, but again, I feel like this guy, he made that in 2002. So it's like very current and or recent rather of a, a suggestion of who might've done it. Yeah. Who done it. Um, and then as fish just mentioned, the <laughs> also one of the theories is that he, uh, do you know who suggested that though? Which one? That he, Hebrews were like a lot, you know. I, honestly, I thought it was Styles, but I would have to. God dang it, Harry Styles. I know. I didn't. Uh, no, Ezra Styles, the guy yeah. who said Phoenicians. Oh, okay. Wow, he's just like throwing out anyone. Yeah, well, that's kind of his thing. Anyone and everyone who just weren't the people who lived there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was Styles. He thought they it were was. either uh, either Phoenician or maybe Hebrew. Okay, cool. So yeah, that because was because awesome. that is what he knew because he was a Hebrew scholar. And honestly, I, the one thing that kind of caught me off guard for this is I'm more used to like mod- current pseudo history and current pseudo archaeology so I'm used to the people peddling the BS to be a little more 
fringy and yeah. let's put it politely completely unqualified to talk about what they're talking about. The people who were taught, who were like investigating this at the time are, I mean, these are some serious intellectuals. Like Ezra Stiles was a president of Yale. He founded Brown. He is, yeah. I mean, these are not whack jobs. These are not, they're not guys with YouTube channels. No, they are not got, they are not, you know, ex wrestling promoters with poofy hair. <laughs> the St. <Saint laughs> Aliens guy. Yeah, it took me a yes. second. I knew who you were talking I, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. 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 Here we yeah, got I, it. Say, I mean, I, he, I believe he has something to say about The Rock as well. Oh, does he really? What does he, he say? Of I he mean, does. He, he doesn't like, I didn't see any quote from him, but I'm going to assume ancient aliens and the fact that um, this is, the rock actually does fall in line with the Bridgewater Triangle. And obviously there have been theories around something a little bit more cryptic creating those carvings. Um, aliens being the, the source of that theory. So I'm not going to say that guy from ancient alien said that, but he might as well. Have. So. Yeah. <laughs> The show's been on for like 19 seasons. I'm sure it's come up at some point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't find a source or a quote, but gosh, there's a lot of episodes to go through. Um, what I liked about going through a lot of the major like theories about who did it was like seeing all the people, like to your point, Fish, that they're all really like renowned people of their time. So I'm going through and I'm seeing all these like old pictures of people and what, or, you know, so in some cases paintings cause pictures weren't a thing yet. And, and then you get to the, the one guy who's saying stuff at like 2002. About and he's China. just some guy. <laughs> he is. A, he's an author. <laughs> he's an author. He's got no like qualifications. He's got no, he could be the guy on YouTube. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, the book <laughs> itself is kind of... It's its not really well-respected for very good reasons. It's not good research. It's slubby. Um, I, th- I think that was it for major theories on it. Did you have any others that I might have missed? Uh, no, no. That's okay. that's the whole big screech. Phoenicians, Hebrew, well, Lost Tribes of Israel, the Norse, the Portuguese, and then the <laughs> Chinese. So the interesting thing about the Norse theory, too, um, so in 1963 is when they actually moved the rock to Berkeley, Massachusetts, so it no longer is in the boundaries of Dighton, which is, it's got its name from. Well, I, think, I think that part of Dighton became Berkeley. Is that what happened? Yeah, well, like... They- Moved the like rock. the rock itself hasn't moved that far. No, it's just they moved it from the river, like uphill a little bit, but it wasn't yeah. basically at the basically at the time it was all Dighton, and then when Berkeley split off, it was already Dighton Rock. So yeah. did they use not the yoke of it. oxen to move the rock? <laughs> it was the sixties. They probably just used a crane. Yeah, <laughs> oddly a- enough, they did have forty yoke of oxen driving the crane. It was very typical. Yes. <laughs> I know this movement was happening a little bit with a little more techno technological advances in the world. So, um, yeah, so it doesn't actually live in Dighton anymore. And probably went cause town lines change over time. Right. But, um, where it was in the ocean, like, uh, not the ocean, sorry, where it was in the river was facing the bay so one of the theories is that if someone did draw it, it was either to warn them of something because of the way it was facing like travelers coming up river or um, to tell a story of something that happened, which like could have been a battle or something like that, or, or a story of people who lived there. Um, and Maybe there was, was also like early ways, you know, you yeah, go it could have been rock and it tells you go up seven X's up the river and, turn left that would actually be amazing if that was what it meant yeah it was just directions up the taunton river it's just tough because unfortunately by the time anyone saw, any european saw this there really wasn't anyone left to ask 
Yeah. Because the whole reason that the that the colonists started that basically they found the rock is because it was on land that they claimed after the end of King Philip's war. So a lot of, so basically at the end of the war, they kind of claim the land as part of their spoils at which point, well, one, they weren't really going to ask the Indians anyway, because well, they just finished a war with them and killed most of them. I don't really have anywhere to follow from that. <laughs> Sorry. That's so- like no. I was trying to, I was trying to follow a sentence up, but at that point there was just no one to ask, and they weren't going to ask them anyway. Yes, it was a non-concern because they yeah, uh, they were too busy to figure yeah. out who else could have carved. Well, I think that's a big part of why they immediately settled on else. Yeah, I mean, you come in and it's either these people who you literally just fought a war with, or literally anyone else. And they all leaned real hard into literally anyone else until it just became the default that it wasn't native. And then you're kind of starting it with that as your base point and then trying to interpret from there, which makes it very spotty. When they moved it in the 60s, was it to preserve it or was there another reason why they moved it? Uh, they were building it. Both. Yeah, it was like column A, column B. They were building a dam, which was going to, I believe, raise the water in the area so they would yeah. no longer be able to see it. And it was also, just after so many years, it, there is erosion on rock from water, obviously. So it was a little bit of both. The timing was right. That was actually the time that apparently someone from the Royal Society of Copenhagen purchased the rock. I thought that and was before then. Or, or it was before them, but like at some point it was mentioned in like the, it was pretty much after they described that um, Vikings had. Yeah, like the, right after that, uh, and there yeah, were plans exactly. to move it either to Boston or Copenhagen. Yes. So, like, or, like at one point, Dent Rock was going to move to Denmark. They were really sold on the fact. Yeah, they bought this that- hard that Vikings were the ones to do it to the point where it was purchased in some manner, shape or form from Norse like descendants. Yeah. And then I think it ended up getting sold back to the old colony historical society to kind of keep it in. Yes. Country. How much does that 40 ton rock go for? I don't know. I've never tried to buy one. Yeah. It didn't actually say that that detail of it was a little bit like it didn't happen quite when they said that it it was uh, suggested that Vikings were the ones that inscribed yeah, I, it, but it was somewhere in between it, that suggestion and before the rock was moved from where it is now, because that, that's when we know it was actually being preserved by an American society, so. Um, and not somewhere in Europe. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, the overlying theme of this, and I listened to a historian talk about it on a podcast it was probably like five minutes long honestly and he was like i don't know why this is still something that's argued about there were other um other markings on rocks found in that area that we are known and have said were native americans and the fact that like some people are still trying to stress that this is something otherwise it it just plays to the psychology of colonism in colonization of the area that there were just certain mindsets that early colonizers could not get into. And one of them was actually that uh, native Americans were here for a long period of time before they were like, they couldn't get that. They were like, no, these people are probably, they probably just got here too. So it wouldn't make sense for them to have done that. And they made it easier to drive them out if they didn't, if you didn't think that they lived here. And like a lot of it ties down to, well, we've kicked them out. We need to make ourselves kind of feel better and justified about it. Right. Um, And that was one of it. That's like a a real study and breakdown of history and the psychology of colonizing the Americas. It was just these people are likely stumbling upon this land too. Therefore we have just as much claim to it as they do. Um, And yeah, just any other, 
explanation besides uh, indigenous or Native American people was the answer to Dighton Rock, but it's definitely been dismissed um, besides all the historical value we find and kind of funny suggestions as to who made it that are still represented today. It's definitely just been settled as Native Americans did it. So that's what, that's my, what I'm going with. What was the most bonkers, like, you know, we covered the most prominent ones, but was there one that was just, like, completely out of left field? I mean, the aliens part is a little... Yeah, aliens? I don't know. I kind of feel like that's the most probable one. <laughs> okay, I would say, um, I mean, the chi- the Chinese suggestion just to me was the one that stood out the most. Yeah, the Chinese one is a little off, and the uh, Phoenician one always struck yes. me as asking a lot of a group of people because there is a huge difference between sailing in the Mediterranean and sailing in the Atlantic Ocean. It's, yeah, they didn't have the ships really for that. N- no, no one did. Like that kind of shipbuilding, there's a reason... It took the Vikings until, you know, like a thousand years later. Exactly. I know. I'm going over to make sure I didn't miss anything. But yeah, I mean, that's re- like the long and short of it is just a lot of uh, poorly intended suggestions of someone making it other than the people who lived here yeah. first. And no one could own up to it. So, which is, I think, just a big lesson in American history or u.s history that like i've said before like trying to filter out like the whitewashed versions of things because it's like oh they discovered this rock i'm like they didn't really it's like they didn't discover the rock the rock obviously someone had been there yeah exactly (laughs) there are drawings on the rock someone did that there had been people living here for thousands of years it is it is literally the ancient rock version of all lives matter Oh. Uh, I mean, you know, that's like, kinda, yeah. the Native Americans did it. Well, anyone could have done it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, anyone could do those. Yeah. So why? Oh, I mean, that? not anyone could do those. Anyone could do those. Oh, I mean, not 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 the natives. They couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> They're dumb and lazy and can't draw on rocks. They can't. They don't understand how to scrape a rock across another rock to make a line because. Excuse me, aren't there, arrowhead made of, aren't there arrowheads made of rock? Shush. <laughs> Shush. <laughs> Shush. Do you think about it. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Just <laughs> yeah. look, thinking about it look, and being racist are... Look, Andy, <laughs> being racist and thinking about it are two very, very separate things. I understand. That's why I made that joke. I know. Yes, yes. I just really wanted to say that out loud. But, uh, I mean, anyone can go and see it now. Not now, now. But in a later hypothetical time, now, the hypothetical now, you can go and look at the building that it's in. Um, it really is right on the Taunton River. Still, they have a little park that surrounds it, um, which is a decent walk for the area, and it's very close to the rest of the Freetown State Forest. Also, part of the Bridgewater Triangle, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that someday. But it, um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty decent area. It's not bad. I had a nice time. When they moved the rock from the river to the new enclosure that it's in, did that shift the ley lines and the magnetic fields of the Bridgewater Triangle? It definitely did. Uh, of course. Okay. <laughs> I, you know what's so funny? I thought about that. I was like, <laughs> never thought I messed anything up. <laughs> I wonder if like everything was okay for a little. No, because that it, 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 it let Bigfoot out, and that's why we don't see yeah. him out here anymore. That yeah. was holding him in place. Oh, gosh. The, the, those writings doing? actually said, do not move rock holding Bigfoot. I know. So, Andy, have you looked at the pictures of the... Uh, I have what, briefly. Um, but uh, I can probably pull it up on the phone. It, it's like kind of interesting to think of what... like. Of course, I read the thing about it being a Rorschach test, and I put my own descriptions of what I thought I was seeing. Oh, which I, what do you see? 
I think some of it kind of lined up with fishes. Like, you see some X's, right? And then I see what seems to be, so you see some faces on the upper right-hand side. Bodies likely attached. Some shapes, I think, what might be animals of some kind. Um, and then leading out from there is kind of where you see, like, to me, it looks like a fish. And then on the very left side, I see someone who looks like they might be in a boat. Followed up by side. maybe okay. a deer. All right. So I'm looking at it now. And on the far left-hand side, I see someone who is clearly wearing a blazer from the 1980s. So they have big shoulder pads. And they have clearly big hair because they have like the poof on top. And then in the middle looks to me like... Uh, a mall food court. So I think this is a very early you are here mall map. And then on the right hand side, you have, you know, the loitering mall rats that are just causing trouble. You know, they're clearly like 11 years old or something. Well, we all see what we want to see. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's right? exactly what that is. And then I think I see people in the middle. It's really, I mean, it's hard I to decide. See people in the middle. Where did you see, I see the deer? On the very far left, it kind of looks like it could be a deer. Okay. Like, very, very far left by the person with the blazer to the left of that. Okay, I don't see the deer. I see a couple of diamonds. And yeah. This is one of those, like you said, every time someone does a representation, it could be completely different. But to me, the the middle looks kind of mappish. It does. I know? definitely see that. It kind of looks like either structures or pathways, and I definitely see three to four X's. Oh, there's at least three. Right. Four, five. Um the the thing that I find most intriguing as to what it possibly could be is, so you have the the mall map in the middle. And then you have the group of mall rats on the far right, but kind of on the same level as the mall rats, but under the map, there is like one, two, three, four squares that are connected with dots in them with like little, they almost look like music notes coming out of them. Yeah, I think I see those. I don't know what that could be. And then there's a th- the shape up at the top that kind of looks like an anvil, kind of, but with an extra piece on the end. It's like in between the mall map and the... The, the one with the blazer? Oh, wait, no, no, no. I see what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's a fairly distinctive shape. Yeah. No idea what that could be. So this but one it could also... be... Like, see how the there, it looks like there's legs coming down off of it? Yeah. This one also no has clue. kind of like, you can tell there's some lighter and some darker. Yeah, I mean, the um, one of the more notable things about it is that, like, a lot of the carvings in it are very significantly, like, car- it wasn't just, like, lazily done. Like, there, you could see them from pretty far away. Yeah. They, uh, they really did their job. And then part of me also wonders if this is just, like where people hung out uh, like think of like in five like a jetty years. situation yeah i was gonna say in five thousand years someone's looking at the jetty being like what does it all mean yeah and, true and it's all just kind of pieced together gibberish that, graffiti yeah graffiti that you know it could be the it, it could literally be the native version of you know this person hearts that person so, Fish, you missed my interpretation. Hannah agrees with me 100%. <laughs> okay. Time Travelers did this. It's a You Are Here mall map. Oh, and so Time Travelers didn't do this. Time Travelers will have done this. Well, they did it in the past, but they will go there in the future. But they haven't done it yet. Well, they haven't gone to the past yet. Exactly. So they haven't yeah. done it yet. Well, they did because they already did it. 
So the, 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 the person on the left is wearing a blazer from the 80s, so they have big shoulder pads. And then in the middle is like a food court map. And even though this was, you know, ancient times, there was still a Sabaro. <laughs> so, so your interpretation of this is Sabaro is eternal? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You hear, you heard it here first. My book will and be coming out soon. Again. <laughs> yeah, but you're editing this. You're going to have to hear at least a couple more times. <laughs> so I think that uh, wraps up Dighton Rock, right? I believe so. All yeah, right. pretty much. Uh, well, as always, Hannah, thank you for uh, doing the heavy lifting. Although Fish actually read a book too. So thanks, Fish. Yeah, Fish, yeah, Fish was there for... Uh... All Dighton Rock needs. <laughs> and uh, you guys are welcome for my mall map interpretation that will go on history as being what Dighton Rock really is. It's very important. T- time traveling, time traveling mall walkers. <laughs> oh, and we still don't have a sign off yet. No, no, we just have the part where we stop talking. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on all social medias at Inebriart, except for Instagram, we're at Inebriart6. You can email us with your questions, complaints, and whatnot at Inebriart at yahoo.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, you can check out the other podcasts on our network, uh, Retro Redoctopus, uh, America's Hometown Horror, and, of course, Bar Talk, Old Colony, and Inebriart Podcast, the original Um, So check those out and subscribe and comment so we can reach more people. And thanks for listening.